Uh, Alkari, we've uh, introduced uh, the multidimensional poverty index, uh, which you have uh, created, which is of such enormous value. Uh, so uh, I hope you will elaborate on that now. Thank you so much, Jeff, and thank you all. Um, I would love to be with you, but I was vaccinated in a developing country, so travel is a little bit more complicated. So in terms of the trends of poverty, when it's understood across different dimensions, um, including the health and the nutrition, the education, and the living standards before the pandemic, there were some positive stories. Across 5 billion people in 75 countries, 65 had significant reductions, and 47 were on track by different metal models of cutting their multidimensional poverty by half if present tense trends continued. And this week on Thursday, we launch updates to those numbers with um, many, many more countries. And that kind of positive trend is also seen in what Jeff introduced as national multidimensional poverty measures, um, which now exist in um, developing countries over 30 uh, and across the world over 64. And for example, in Nepal, uh, multidimensional poverty was cut by half in an eight year period. And in Colombia, over eight years, it reduced by one third. So there were very positive trends. Post pandemic, it's slow. So five countries have as yet updated their official national statistics. In Mexico and in Ecuador, poverty rose by two percentage points. In Costa Rica, sorry, in Colombia, it rose by 0.6 percentage point. And in Costa Rica and in Afghanistan, it fell very slightly. But those were 2020 data and 21 data will be worse. And clearly many countries have not yet reported. So we can't comment on trends post pandemic using real data. And the post pandemic World Bank surveys that we have analyzed um, are very useful and they give signals, but not yet a conclusive number. So that's one comment on the trends that there is cause for hope, but the urgency that the speakers articulated is even greater at this particular period, but it's also tangible. So to that next, we've mentioned children. In every national MPI that has been published, children are poorer than adults. In, and we disaggregate the global MPI by children and adults in every country. And in no countries are children significantly less poor than adults. And so that is a pivotal group. And also within countries, um, there's great variety. So we disaggregate, for example, the global MPI by 1,291 subnational regions. And you can see which groups are poorest and over time, are they catching up as in the case of India or are they falling further behind as in other cases? And you can see also how each subnational region, in this case, the states of India, reduced poverty. And so the second point is that not only were trends going down, but also now with the data, you can exactly see where the interventions, where the money needs to be sent, the institutions need to be built, programs and schemes, and how this varies, for example, across the states of Afghanistan. So there's information from metrics that's not perfect, but it means that the money that's spent can be more effective. And with a same fiscal envelope, there can be accelerations. The third is what about the COVID? One observation, and we've been working full-time on this since March, 2020, has been a lot of innovation in blending data sets across administrative. Um, Sorry, Sabina, you have only one minute more, please. Sorry, but we need to, to, to be in the time. Yes. So um, I won't say that. I'll, I'll turn only to my last slide. And that is that what can this group bring? So what I have put forward to you are, is in a sense the secular poverty discourse, which is the ethical fundamental need to look at the poor and also the need uh, uh, to, and the possibility of using data metrics and policies to change that trend. But there's something else about the blessedness of the poor in spirit, which is that you can see in some communities relationships of love and solidarity, forgiveness, and others enmity, um, oppressive tendencies even among themselves. In some, there's prayer, there's meaning, inner peace and joy despite difficulty. And in others, there's bitterness and fury, desperation, grief, alienation. 
In some, there are virtues of hard work and reliability. In others, there is deceit. In some, there is simplicity and if comfort with this. Others come out of poverty with the materialism that mimics the rich. Some have agency to shape their own lives, to listen to their vocation and respond in a generous way. But others feel their agency is gone and they game the system. We also don't appreciate the contribution of the poor. How many children do they raise? How do they contribute to the economy, to the churches, to the societies? Viewing them as a burden overlooks the positive contributions that are made. So I think that part of the distinctive angle of this group is also looking at the people who are coming out of poverty and caring for their virtues, for their vocations, for their desire to walk life lightly on this planet and to care for others with solidarity, even if they have come out of acute situations themselves. So I think that voice is absent in the secular discourse on poverty. And that is what this group could bring because it is also sorely needed to bring together the well-being and the poverty work. Thank you. Davina. Thank you for uh, the, the excellent presentation and the good guidance. And everybody's uh, PowerPoints will be available uh, and uh, we'll make sure that people can see them because uh, we can't uh, study the details uh, in real time as uh, these wonderful presentations are being made. We're going yeah. to... Could I just say one last thing, which is that Thursday, um, we'll launch a global report on unmasking disparities with a focus on ethnicity and gender. And those Great. two things haven't come up, but I think they're quite central. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, the, the